appreciate the opportunity to uh, share this content and uh, be a part of the accelerator. And I really appreciate the work that everyone at the accelerator is doing. So thanks for that. Uh, with that, I'll share my screen and get this presentation underway. Okay. And I'm guessing everyone can see this. Thumbs up. Great. All right. So, um, you know, I've just got introduced, so I don't think I have to rehash things uh, too much here, uh, other than to say that, you know, our company here is in Portland, Oregon, um, and, you know, we're focusing on zero energy and passive house buildings and recently have started uh, really paying attention not just to the embodied carbon uh, in the buildings, which we're going to touch on with the concrete free slab, but also just retrofits and uh, trying to decarbonize the built environment. So um, those are our main focuses here. Um, I'll do my best for those Canadians in the crowd to, if it comes up to speak and you know, let you know if I'm speaking Fahrenheit or Celsius, those kinds of things. Um, and I, yeah, please ask questions and um, I'd be happy to answer them at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So with that, let me forward the screen here, if it will. There we go. Um, so concrete has huge environmental impacts, right? So, you know, it's, it itself, that one material contributes 8% of the total greenhouse gas emissions on the planet, right? Just this one material. So, um, and also cement, if it was a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world, just this one material. And it's also the most used material on earth uh, behind water. So, as you can see during the manufacturing process here, this is from McKinsey and Company, you know, you have to go all the way back to the quarry where you're grabbing these raw materials, transporting them to the crusher, to the raw mill. And then you can see where it's highlighted here in the middle. This is uh, where most of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. So we're using fossil fuels to create really high temperatures to create this clinker, to create the cement that's being used. So this one material really has outsized uh, embodied carbon. Um, and so obviously we're trying to use less of this in our buildings. Um, so another thing that people don't tend to think about or you hear, you hear often about these stats about it's 8% or you know, it's uh, got all this high embodied carbon, but um, you know, the sand that's used in concrete has also got huge impacts. This was a documentary, I believe it was in uh, National Geographic about these sand mafias. And you know, it gets into like, um, you know, these, these illegal networks, right, that, that have resulted in violent conflicts. Um, you know, these people will threaten whistleblowers, they'll bribe local politicians and law enforcement officers. Um, there's been hundreds of murders in the past few years, all around extracting sand. And that's before we even talk about, you know, the environmental impacts of extracting the sand too. So it's the largest extractive industry in the world is sand. And this has huge impacts on river deltas, lakes, and beaches, and all the destruction that comes along with that. So uh, desert sand doesn't work for concrete. It's too round. We need to have more cubic sand, and this is where you tend to find it in these river deltas. So uh, embodied carbon, social, all these impacts, right? So this chart in the middle is one that I always start my presentations off with. So, you know, buildings account for about 39% of all the greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. Uh, the materials and construction account for 11% of that. So, you know, concrete is also, besides this impact that it has on the operational embodied carbon, uh, it's a good conductor of energy. So when we're looking at slabs, which is the focus of this talk, um, most of the losses that are happening from inside that building are happening through that slab edge because it's just a good conductor, right? So we're losing our energy from that slab, but we're also getting comfort impacts too, right? So, you know, if it's cold or hot outside, we're going to reflect that into the building and affect our occupants too. So uh, typically the concrete in a home's foundation uh, has more embodied carbon than the rest of the house and all the items that you put inside of that house. So we really want to pay attention to reducing the amount of the stuff that we can. It's, a, it's obviously a very useful product, right? So, you know, you, one has to kind of ask themselves, like, what's, what is this concrete slab doing uh, in our building, right? Um, you know, this is kind of a, a joke here where there's the two types of concrete. There's concrete that's cracked, and then there's the concrete that's not cracked yet. Um, but 
beyond that, like as far as we can tell, the main point of the concrete and slab is just to for us to stand on and for us to put things on. You know, typically for most residential projects, it's non-structural. Certainly when you get into larger multi multifamily and commercial buildings and you have post-tension slabs and things like that, it does become a structural element. But in many buildings, it's simply just something to put something on, right? Put your stuff on or to stand on. And um, another thing about it too, is that it's difficult to install flooring over concrete, right? We wanna make sure, you know, as it's curing, it releases a lot of moisture. Um, if you're gonna do it successfully, you wanna make sure you have a good vapor barrier below it. And then you wanna make sure that you're ideally coating it with some sort of uh, liquid applied, applied like epoxy or something, a vapor barrier on top of it before you put on your battens and your, and your finished flooring. So it's a complicated thing to put flooring on top of. Um, you know, slabs are also, they're, they're rarely level or plain if you really get down to it. Um, they take concrete, has specialized equipment and subs. Um, it's fairly expensive, especially in today's market. Um, and if you need repairs, uh, it's really difficult to cut concrete out and remove it and then replace it. So um, we kind of just started asking ourselves, well, what's the, the point of all this, right? So what do all successful slab on grades have? They've got five basic layers, right? So first of all, there's the native undisturbed soils. We want to put our houses on good stable soils. Um, two is the, the gravel that gets laid down. And this is a capillary break to stop that bulk water from being wicked up into our buildings. And it's also a soil gas depressurization field. So this is what would collect all the radon gases and stuff like that so they can be safely you know, exited from the building. Uh, on top of that, typically you've got an insulation layer. Um, you wanna, again, make it comfortable. Um, then you have your vapor barrier. We wanna be able to stop that vapor drive from the ground, which is typically at 100% relative humidity, no matter where you are on the planet, from our buildings, which is typically less than 100% or hopefully less than 100% relative humidity inside your building. Um, and then on top of that, you've got your slab, right? Your standing surface. and this is the part that you know has that potential for some impact, right? Is to replace that concrete. So uh, introducing the concrete-free slab on grade. Um, this is just a cross section of a project that we uh, we've done a couple of now, where we've used ICFs as our stem wall. Um, and you know, I'm happy to share these slides too. I can uh, put a link into the accelerator to get these out. Happy to open source these things if people are interested. Um, but as you can see, all five layers are present. There's really not much difference in the first four layers. Um, and then above that for the slab itself, we've simply got two cross laminated pieces of uh, three quarter inch plywood. And then on top of that, our finished flooring. So that's the, the main difference here. So this is a, a great illustration that was done in Fine Home Building Magazine about this particular ICF concrete free slab on grade that we did. Um, I did give this link um, to Shannon, and she could put that up on the uh, on the chat uh, to check out this article in Fine Home Building Magazine. But again, here you can see where we've got the the native soils, our gravel, our insulation layers, our vapor barrier, and then the plywood, um, and then the finished flooring over the top of that. So it's it's a fairly simple uh, thing. So I thought what I'd do is just kind of take you know, you threw step by step with some photos of, of an actual project that we uh, completed. Uh, we've done, uh, I think, three, and we're currently working on our fourth um, concrete free slab on grade project. So um, the first one's pretty straightforward here. There's, there's no real difference here. Uh, you excavate down, uh, throw down your gravel, compact it, and get it ready for your footings and your stem walls, right? So, um, the next step here is you're going to set your uh, forms, uh, pour your foundation walls, and, and then backfill. Um, again, fairly typical. In this case, what we're showing here are some ICFs that we used. Um, and then what we do is we fill that um, the interior part of this foundation with our three-quarter inch gravel. Um, you want to use gravel with no fines in it. Again, you want this to be something that will not get clogged up and, and you know, wick water up. So you want to make it a capillary break. Um, and, and that's it. There's really not much difference here compared to a regular stem wall and footing so far. So 
Um, here's where it gets a, a, a little bit different. So what we're going to, on a typical slab, you get to the point where you'd have your gravel in there. Then you would set your insulation, your vapor barrier, and pour your concrete. Now, with the concrete free slab on grade, we can't really put our vapor barrier down and then start framing because what if it rains? Uh, we're going to end up with the giant pool of water, right? That's bad. Um, whereas if it was a concrete slab, it would just run right off. It just, it, it's a moot point, right? So we have to do things in slightly different order, right? So uh, we end up framing our walls and our roofs and we dry the building out um, before we install our slab or before we even install anything, any of the insulation or vapor barriers or anything like that. So it's, it's a little bit uh, out of order. Um, but what it does mean is when you do get this thing stood up and, and insulated or uh, dried out rather, um, when you're completing the rest of the slab, you're working indoors, which in Portland, Oregon, it's quite rainy here. Uh, winters are cold, summers are hot. Uh, it's, it's fairly pleasant to be working indoors when you're working on that slab. So the next step is to install your sub slab plumbing and all that groundwork plumbing and stuff like that. So uh, what we did on this particular project is we had that three quarter inch gravel and then we threw some quarter minus gravel on top of that. Um, this was due to timing. Uh, in the future, uh, I would hold off on that quarter inch gravel uh, because when the plumber came through, he started digging his trenches for his plumbing and he had to make piles. You can kind of see on the right hand photo in the back, we got some, we piled up the quarter minus gravel to keep it separate from the three quarter gravel. Um, you know, but anyways, point being is it's pretty easy for your plumbers to work in this stuff. They can scooch it out of the way pretty easily, set in all that plumbing. Then you replace your three quarter inch and then put the quarter minus back over the top. Um, one thing you do want to pay attention to is making sure that you get your plumbing lines far enough down that they're not going to rise up above this gravel layer. And I'm going to show you a picture of where that happened in one of our projects. And this is one of those, um, let me fail first and uh, take that punch and then and show you guys so you can avoid it yourselves. So um, the next uh, step is you, you get that quarter minus gravel down and you screed it out. Um, we simply just shot a laser um, as a reference, measure down, and you screed it out with just a, a typical two by four. You can see uh, Fidel and Evan here on the right um, going through leveling that out and then throwing down uh, the first layer of foam. Um, so on the left, I've got a red arrow here kind of showing where those plumbing pipes could have been a little bit deeper, right? So what that meant was when we got to installing that layer of foam, we had to carve around those things which did take um, extra time and, and labor and stuff like that. So something to avoid. Uh, on this particular project, we're using a, a GPS foam. So this is the graphite impregnated EPS foam. Um, you know, we're using EPS on the current project because you can't get GPS now. Um, one could use XPS. Typically our structural engineers, the foam rating that you're gonna get with like a type one foam is plenty fine for the loads that you're going to see inside of a residential building. So you don't have to do anything crazy with the, the foam or the density of it or anything like that. So as we go through, you know, we, we offset um, our panels. So we're running these uh, foam sheets perpendicular to one another and then offset from one another too, so that we can break those, uh, those lines. So we're not getting any thermal bridging up through those gaps between the, the foam. Um, this is all pretty easy. You can see that we've got our windows installed, the roof is on. Um, you know, it was a pretty rainy time when we were installing this project, so it was nice for the team to be inside uh, when we were doing it. Uh, you can see on the right where we've had to carve out some of that foam for that plumbing again. And uh, next, um, they're on your first layer of plywood, right? So we have used in the past just regular CDX plywood. Uh, and we've also used the tongue and groove version of the CDX plywood. And uh, in the end, the, they both performed well, but we noticed that the tongue and groove kind of had a little more rigidity on the floor. Um, and we're gonna stick with that in the future, even though it's a little more difficult to install, um, it's not that much more difficult and we think the benefits are worth it. So, um, you know, we've done both. I, 
I would have no problem doing either or, but we tend to go for that T and G just because it gives it a little more uh, rigidity uh, with that. So because it is wood and it's floating, um, you know, we should back up a little bit. You know, once we get our um, foam installed, we then install our vapor barrier and make sure we tape all those seams, right? Um, what our team does is we take a flap, like 12 inches of that product, the typically a 10 mil polyethylene sheet, and we put that below our mud sill. Um, and then that on the exterior, that connects to our air barrier, goes below the mud sill. And then on the interior, we just tape it to the field vapor barrier in there. So we have a completely continuous air barrier that travels under that mud sill and then connects to the sheathing, which is our air barrier in this case. So um, really easy to throw down that 12 inch stripe of polyethylene. Um, and rolling out the polyethylene in the field is, is easy too. So uh, next you're gonna install your second layer of plywood. Um, so what we do here is we um, get some construction adhesive, lay that down, and then we install uh, the sheet again, perpendicular to the lower layer and offset at those seams to give it the most rigidity. Um, and then we screw it together with inch and a quarter screws. So we've got two three quarter inch layers of plywood, that's an inch and a half, and we throw down those inch and a quarter screws because we don't want to go through there and puncture our, our vapor barrier. Um, if there were a few screws that punctured through here and there, um, I really wouldn't be too concerned. You know, a little bit of vapor coming in from the ground and a few holes really isn't gonna be that big of a deal. There's not a lot of air movement going through the ground, um, but clearly if you can avoid it, avoid it. And it's pretty easy to do, so. Um, this is just uh, a, a kind of a, a photo in progress here. Um, in this particular case, this is a different project where the windows were delayed due to market uh, reasons. Uh, and, but we went ahead and started installing this anyways, and it really wasn't much of a problem. We didn't get enough rain that it um, filled up uh, our house and created a bathtub. Um, the, the arrow I'm showing here is pointing to these little kick plates. Um, as we were installing our second layer of plywood and using kind of like a big uh, sledge to kind of bang it together, it shifted the lower layer of plywood as it was doing that. So what we did is we put down that first layer, second layer, excuse me, of plywood over the first. And then we just took some scrap plywood, two bys, and then nailed it to the mud sill and then to that first layer so that when we were putting the subsequent layers down and smacking it in with our sledgehammers, it didn't shift it and move it. Um, so easy enough to do, quick little tip. Um, you can see too that we've given a little bit of a gap between the edge of the plywood and the wall itself of the insulation. Because it's wood, it will expand uh, and contract. So we give it at least a half inch, ideally three quarters of an inch from the edge so that it can move and expand and contract without um, buckling or anything like that. So um, once that's installed, it's time to um, frame your interior wall. So it's, uh, you know, again, a little bit out of order. Um, you know, none of the walls in this particular project were load bearing. Um, you know, if there were, we'd have to run probably a stem wall and a footing through the interior of the building. Um, and then detail around that. But in this case, um, there were no structural interior walls. So we just go ahead and start uh, framing them up uh, afterwards. Um, on that bottom plate, uh, when we're nailing that in, uh, we're using two and a half inch nails. Again, you've got an inch and a half for that bottom plate and an inch and a half of built up plywood. So you wouldn't want to use a three inch nail or a three and a half inch nail because you would go all the way through. So, um, just shorten up your nails there, not too big of a deal. Um, and then lastly, uh, start installing your finishes. Um, you know, really it's no different at this point than installing uh, something on a, just a typical wood frame floor. Um, so not too big of a deal. Um, one thing that you do wanna pay attention to um, is because it is a wood floor and it's on grade, you want to make sure you're not creating some sort of vapor sandwich, right? We want to be able to make sure that we're paying attention to the permeability of the products that we're putting on top of our wood slab. And so we want to make sure that they are vapor permeable so that if you do get the occasional spill, 
or overflow or something like that, that that water won't get trapped in there and you know create havoc uh, in that assembly. And so we're looking for a permeable flooring. And interestingly, originally we found this bamboo uh, engineered flooring and um, it turned out that once we kind of started, well, first of all, no flooring manufacturer has any idea what the permeability of their product is, or at least none that we reached out to. It's not something that they typically declare on their products. Um, so it is hard to find, you know, permeability of specific flooring products. So it can be tricky, um, but some flooring manufacturers are willing to work with you. Uh, we did find a bamboo that looked great. It was a green certified eco product, whatever it was, but it turned out it had like a real thin layer of plastic sheeting going across one of, one of the layers. Um, luckily, we discovered this uh, before we laid it down and we're able to switch it out with the clients and use something really similar. So, uh, you know, a, a dimensional natural wood an engineered wood or something like that, a cork, a marmoleum, all these things are good. They're all permeable, but you're definitely gonna wanna pay attention on some of these products that can get a little bit tricky. Again, you wouldn't want to um, trap moisture, you know, more so than that plywood has an ability to dry, right? So, um, you know, this is the, the finished product here, um, you know, no different than a, a regular floor. It's great to install. Um, you know, if we go back here on the bottom right, you can see the gang is just um, using your typical flooring install, you know, nail guns and all that stuff. They didn't really know the difference, um, just mailed it in. Um, and, you know, when you're walking on these floors, um, it has a gift to it. You know, when you stand on a concrete slab, it's hard. You know, that'll get people's knees over time. It's not super pleasant uh, to be on for a long time. These, they don't, uh, they don't squish. Uh, they, it's, it's a similar experience to like a wood framed floor, maybe a little bit softer, um, which our clients who in this case were, um, gosh, they were probably in their 60s, really enjoyed and have really enjoyed since. It's just got a little bit more of a give to the floor um, because it is a floating assembly. All right. So things to pay attention to, um, bathrooms and wet rooms, you know, people will choose tile typically in these locations. Um, oftentimes that tile is not vapor permeable. Um, and in this particular case, we had a client decide to do a threshold free shower after we had started the assembly. And then we were really left scratching our heads. Well, how do we do a threshold free floating plywood and get the you know tile set and all this stuff. So we actually had to retrofit it where we cut it out. Um, and it's a lot easier to cut out plywood than you know four inches of concrete, right? So grab the saws, cut it out, um, you know, removed a layer of foam, uh, dropped it down a little bit, reinstalled our vapor barrier and poured a mud set pan over the top of that. So it worked out pretty well. Um, one thing you're gonna to wanna to do is use a decoupling membrane if you're putting tile over this because the floor is floating, it does have a little bit of give. And so you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're decoupling that movement from the floor and the tile so that you don't get broken grout lines and stuff like that. So definitely wanna throw down that decoupling membrane, which by the way, is not vapor permeable. Um, this is just a plastic product, right? Um, but you know, as long as there's adjacent areas for that wood to dry to, should it get wet, we're not really too concerned. Um, you know, there's the storage capacity of materials. We have to be able to allow our materials, if they get wet, the ability to retain moisture without damage and be able to dry. Now, I probably wouldn't put, you know, a decoupling membrane or an impermeable flooring over the entirety of the whole slab but we feel comfortable doing it just in a wet room or something like that, knowing that there's adjacent areas next to where that can dry to. So, um, I wanna be realistic here. Um, there are challenges. You know, one of the things that the carpenters learned real quick um, was you can't just throw down your framing lumber and frame off the ground anymore because you're working off of gravel, right? And so we ended up, basically having to build, got these little sawhorses, as you can see on the right, um, where we built the walls off of before we stood them up. So, you know, took a little extra time, a uh, little extra 
hassle uh, to do, but not the end of the world. And the team was actually able to be pretty efficient on these builds. Um, another thing we learned, a uh, current project we're working on, it's got a moderate slope. And so it dropped maybe two and a half, three feet from the highest point of the house to the lowest. And uh, as we excavated that and set our forms and did the concrete, we then had to fill that back up with gravel. And it did use a lot of gravel. We had to truck in quite a bit. Um, and that was a, a pretty good expense for that. And, you know, the team was like, well, is this really that much better than a, you know, if we were to hung, hang a, um, a wood framed wall off of that? Um, but in the end, we think it still made more sense from a building science and, and thermal perspective uh, than some of the origami that you'd have to do with a wood framed uh, wall, like a, like a conditioned crawl or something like that. Um, not to mention the cool thing about slab on grade is that they're really accessible. Um, this particular house we're building is for an older couple and her, one of their sisters is in a wheelchair. And so we're, this is all ADA. And the nice thing about slab on grade is they're not raised up like a typical crawl would be. So there are certainly benefits to it, but um, it, we did spend some money on that gravel and it's a little bit different. Um, also, you know, as we're raising up walls, uh, you have to set up your uh, wall jacks to keep everything plumb. And we ended up just kind of driving stakes into the gravel. Uh, typically, this would just get nailed off on your wood deck. Um, but not the end of the world, just but something to pay attention to. So, um, so the project I, I showed um, was an ICF uh, stem wall. And the current project that we're working on, we kind of had an epiphany was, well, hey, why not, if we can skip the ICFs and not have that, you know, plastic in the ground too, wouldn't that be all the better? And so what we did is we did a typical footing and stem wall, and we did a knockout with just a two by six on the top of the stem wall, and then filled that with our, our foam in there, and then attached our, our uh, sub slab foam to that and then had exterior insulation on the wall, the framed wall, and then dense pack cellulose in the framed wall. And uh, this actually works so that we can avoid exterior insulation on the outside of the stem wall, which is a headache, really. I mean, do you put it in while you're pouring the concrete? Do you put it on after? How do you hold it in there? What's the embodied carbon of that particular material? You know, what kind of protection board are you putting over the top of it? And all those expenses are really avoided. Um, we ended up doing a, a therm model on this. Um, and so it works, as you can see here. Um, if you look at the temperature gradient, we're staying at 66.6 .6 kind of evil degrees uh, on the inside here. Um, but in Portland, Oregon, on a design degree day, I want to say it was 14 degrees, I think is what they punched in on this one. Um, you know, it's still staying uh, warm on the interior and we're, there's no risk of condensation or mold at that critical junction right there. So it works. We were able to enter the psi value into our Woofy passive model and uh, it barely moved the needle. So um, really cool way to avoid that extra embodied carbon, the extra labor and steps there. So here's a picture of that uh, exact assembly here. Um, we, again, we take that little 12 inch rip of um, polyethylene under our bottom plate. We still put the sill seal on there. And then we attach our uh, mud sill to that. Um, on the exterior, um, we actually set our mud sill in a half inch into the building so that when we put on our sheathing, it's in the same plane as the concrete. And then what that allows us to do is to take a piece of tape, you know, like a Sega Fentrum or something like that, attach that to the concrete, it bonds to that uh, green vapor barrier, air barrier, and to the plywood, which is our primary air barrier there. So um, really secure, good air barrier connection there um, and, and easy to do, really. So. so some of the fringe benefits of the concrete free slab on grade, right? Um, you know, it removes delays due to the busy trades, right? So if you're, you know, you, if you're waiting on your concrete sub, uh, or you're waiting for the, the concrete truck to show up or any of those things, suddenly you don't have to worry about that. This is all under your purview as a contractor, right? You can schedule your team to work, start framing as soon as you're ready and not have to rely on others, right? Um, 
The fact that it's done in-house, here's a little picture of our team, um, means that we actually have a higher margin on work that's performed in-house than is subbed out. So financially for us, we're either able to lower the cost to our clients or we're able to make more money or you know, use that as a buffer for other parts of that project, right? So it's just more cost effective. Um, and it also is just compared to a concrete slab, it's more comfortable. Um, and that's what your clients are really gonna you know, let you know <laughs> if it's not comfortable. Having that plywood underfoot underneath all that insulation, um, you know, even if you have concrete that's at 70 degrees, it still feels cold to the touch. And, you know, having the wood floors is a nicer experience. So, yeah, you know, I, I get lots of people that think this is crazy and they come up with all sorts of reasons why it won't work, right? But, you know, what if you get a, what if you get a flood? What if your water heater explodes or your, you know, your kid leaves the faucet on and overnight or who knows what but what i'll say to that is like well what if you had a concrete slab on grade and you had your wood floors over it and you had a flood well that's a real hassle to deal with um with the slab on grade anyways right i mean floods are bad even with concrete right you still have to replace all the sheetrock that got damaged and all that and i'll make an argument that to replace you know, the concrete is hard, but if you have to replace the plywood, let's say there's a leak or you have to access a broken plumbing line below this thing, you just grab your saw, you cut out a, a square, and then you cut out a smaller square and you can access the thing, put your smaller square back, glue it, put your bigger square back and walk away. Um, you can do that in less than an hour with typical tools versus having to break out concrete and cut it and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, the other question I get to is like, that can't possibly support all the loads inside of a house. Um, you know, this is the trans Alaskan highway where they actually are supporting uh, a road. Uh, you know, uh, lots, lots of airports are built with this geo foam. Um, there's really no issue from a structural perspective, uh, with using foam when it comes to loads. All right. Um, Another common thing I get is, well, what about bugs, critters, all that kind of stuff? Um, this is a typical, I just took a screenshot of a, of a typical termite, you know, resistant assembly. No reason you couldn't do the same thing, right? Keep your wood siding eight inches above grade, make a metal termite shield at that mud sill, use your gutters and downspouts, keep it dry, treat your soil for termites, remove all the flora and stuff from around your house to keep the bugs away from it. Um, you can do all this, right, to keep the bugs out. Um, and typically bugs aren't super interested in things in, in dry wood, they like moist wood. And if you're doing it right, you really, there's no reason that plywood should ever be moist, right? Um, and, you know, maybe this isn't for everything. I mean, if you're really in termite land and there's nothing you can do about it, maybe the concrete free slab on grade isn't the best foundation for you. Maybe you should be using piers and setting it up off the ground. Maybe you should do a full basement. Maybe you should do a regular crawl, right? So I'm not gonna say it's, it works for every single scenario, but we're certainly not super concerned about the, the, the bugs and vermin and stuff like that. So, you know, we touched on this a little bit, you know, the, floor, the floors are warm, uh, they're forgiving, they're comfortable. Um, so um, doors and thresholds, and we're trying to make those, you know, uh, thermally broken from the outside. It's actually really nice and easy with this because you can just connect your, your thermal layer really well. Um, and there's just less thermal bridges with this particular thing. So there's less opportunity for mold growth and poor under air quality and that kind of stuff. So um, then I'll say, don't just stop there, right? I mean, we got rid of all that concrete that was in that slab but we still have concrete where we have our stem wall and footing, right? So this is uh, our current project. We're working with the Oregon DEQ uh, on a new slab blend where we're using some slag in here. And uh, we're able to knock down the embodied carbon in that concrete by 50, 50%, right? So, um, you know, the foam that we're looking at there, it's, it's XPS, but it's the newer formulation, the, the NGX, I think it's called where it has a much lower, it's more similar to like an EPS foam, um, roughly. 
Um, so pay attention to the materials that you are using, right? So we got rid of that concrete slab, the concrete we had to use, we knocked the embodied carbon back by 50% on top of that, all right? Um, steel, lots of embodied carbon, use fiberglass rebar, right? It's also less conductive. That's a great thing to do. Also design, um, try to engineer, work with your structural engineers so that you have less interior footings and point loads. Maybe there's a way to use a beam, in, you know, above instead of a grade beam. Um, maybe you can switch to a TGI or a parallel cord truss to avoid interior footings. So all those interior footings are going to require more foam and more concrete. So let's just not use them in the first place through good design, right? And uh, the other thing to point out is, um, you know, with the wood that you're using, if you can use the, you know, the Forest Stewardship Council certified wood uh, that comes from local sources, that's what we're doing on our current build, that's hugely impactful too. And um, I took this picture on the right because I was just remarking on how nice this framing lumber was. It was actually created as a number one, this one in front here. Um, that's some really great looking lumber that was harvested just locally here in uh, the Portland, Oregon area. So, and uh, with that, thanks. Thanks for.